John Munger's Memorial, May 21st, 2013, one of possibly two. <laughs>
1949, my uncle Bud got a job with the United Fruit Company and they moved to Panama and then they spent the next 10 years living in various places in South America. John's mother taught him how to read and his early education was a combination of both homeschooling and attending <laughs> local grade schools when they were available. Through letters from his parents, I learned that John took his first dance class in 1952 and in 1953 he was in his first school play one that the teacher wrote especially to feature John. <laughs> um, during this time period, he came to know what it felt like to be in a minority group. Of course, you know, everybody else was Hispanic, and he, they were part of a small gringo population that was discriminated against at that time in South America. And this, of course, caused him to be a strong proponent of civil rights. Now, John's father was very conservative, but his mother was liberal, and of course, we all know who had the bigger influence. <laughs> now, I'm sure he had classmate friends, but I really got the impression that John spent most of his time with his parents. And from the beginning, they treated him like an adult and not a child, and so he always seemed more grown up than the rest of us cousins when we were together. Um, in the fall of 1959, because his schooling was not challenging enough down in South America, his parents enrolled him at St. Mark's Prep School in Massachusetts. Now once again, John felt like he was part of a minority. But this time, it was because he hadn't been raised like a typical American teenager. He didn't understand football, he hadn't grown up watching I Love Lucy and American Bandstand, he didn't eat hot dogs and french fries. The first year was really hard for him. His fellow students thought he was odd, and they nicknamed him Yogi, but um, he adapted and he got through it, and by the time he graduated, he was on the soccer and wrestling team, he won the Founders Medal for Academic Achievement, and he was one of 17 um, graduates to be accepted at Harvard. Now, my first memorable connection with John <laughs> happened in the summer of 1960 when uh, he and his parents came to visit my family in Grand Forks. Now, he was not like any of my other cousins. He gave me a book on yoga, and he taught me yoga postures in our living room. Now, I was from North Dakota. I, I never even heard of yoga. But I kept that book, and I eventually started practicing yoga, and today I have a special yoga room in my house, and it's all because of John's influence. So John enrolled in, uh, at Harvard in the fall of 1963, and he was a member of Dunster House. And when he had to declare a major, it was either going to be classical piano or English literature. And he chose the latter because it was more practical. Well, he was a very accomplished <laughs> pianist. And, and about this time, his parents moved to Pakistan. And so John spent several summers there. However, it was too long a trip to make a Christmas, so we invited him, we invited him to spend the holidays with our family in North Dakota. And this was when John and I really clicked and became, as he described it, not cousins, but accomplices. <laughs> so my sisters and I have an older sister and a younger sister. We thought John was a riot. He was a, a bit eccentric, and he was always up to something interesting. He made handmade cards for the gifts that he gave us. And my younger sister was a big fan of the British pop groups, and she had invented this fictitious group called Tucker and the Teddy Boys. So John and I gave her a Beatles album, and we created this fake cover for it, featuring the Bonanza gang all holding instruments as Tucker and the Teddy Boys. And this was a huge hit, and there were pictures of it out in the, in the lobby. And she still has it today, um, you know, in Florida. So I also visited John when he was at Harvard a couple of times. He took me to hear Jim Queskin and the Jug Band with Joff and Maria Muldar live. He introduced me to the music of Charles Osnivor and Tom Lehrer, and he woke me up every morning with loud Sousa marches. <laughs> um, after graduating from Harvard, John got a job at Gould Academy in Bethel, Maine, teaching English. He was there for two years before he got the job offer at Fountain Valley School in Colorado Springs. And that, of course, was a turning point in John's life when he went out to Colorado. Now, what I realized while I was preparing for this was that, you know, I may be John's blood-related family, but once he got to the Twin Cities, you and Sharon and the cats, you were his real family. So many of you spent way more time with him than I ever did. 
taking classes, rehearsing, being in performances, having coffee on Saturdays. And I really want to thank you for the support and love and respect that, um, that you gave him. When he was in the hospital last month, I read him all your posts from Facebook, and he always had an anecdote or a comment about each one of you, and you could tell he was really touched by uh, what you wrote. And those comments also helped my sisters and cousins get to know what John was really like. My mother especially wanted to come tonight, but at age 91, she couldn't make the trip from Grand Forks, but she sends her regards. Once again, thank you a million times over for being there for John all these years, and for all of you being accomplices for the wacky, wild, and wonderful John R. Munger. We'll miss you, cuz, and we'll never forget you. from over 40 years, from Colorado to Minneapolis, Mr. Tom Kattok. This is amazing. This dance community has done a lot for me. Um, I know it did a lot for John. And uh, this is a, um, an impressive display of love and support for somebody that did a lot for us. And um, I wanted to sing a couple songs for John. Um, when I met, first met John, because, let me see, no, that was a non sequitur. Um, uh, most of you knew him as a wonderful choreographer and a master teacher and uh, a, you know, a, a good friend. And uh, when I first met him, um, I just thought he was crazier than a shithouse rat. <laughs> and I thought, there's no way I'm ever going to connect with this guy. And, um, I'm from Stearns County, so I get it. <laughs> this first song I'm going to do, um, actually we could add to this, if I'll post it on, uh, on Facebook, but um, it's an old um, Ray Rep tune. Now, Ray Rep was a a guy who wrote music after the Vatican II, so all you Catholics out there, you know how crappy that, that was. Um, and the music and the guitars and, you know, the sentiment and stuff. So I'm going to get a little sentimental, probably a lot. I hope I can get through this. Um,
weekends A newspaper blown through the grass falls On the round toes of the high shoes Of the old friends Winter companions, the old <laughs> lost in their overcoats, waiting for the sun. The sounds of the city sifting through trees settle like dust on the shoulder. Of the old friend. Can you imagine the years from today sharing a park bench quietly? How terribly strange to be sixty-four. Brushes the same years, silently sharing the same fears. Time it was, and what a time it was, it was a time of innocence. A time of confidences Long ago it must be I have a photograph Preserve your memories They're all that's left you and organized for us. And actually, we had sort of planned to stop playing that now, but I don't think we've gotten all the way through it, so I think we'll let it continue to play. So I'm doing a John Munger, changing in the middle of the show and speaking directly to the technician. <laughs> <laughs> I think in this moment it's professional. <laughs> all right, we are very lucky to have another person here, representative tonight of John's career in dance. She's a 30-year colleague of John's, a friend, and I think yet another partner in crime. Please welcome Bonnie Brooks. I cannot, in my wildest dreams, imagine being anywhere except right here tonight with all of you. I'm going to go off script immediately because as I was um, as I was listening to Tom's beautiful song, thank you so much. I could hear John responding to me. We're sitting in the Hennepin Center in the old offices of Minnesota Independent Choreographers Alliance that came became became Minnesota Dance Alliance. John, yes, um. <laughs> could you bring the numbers in here? We have to, yes. <laughs> he read my mind. He knew before I even asked for it what I wanted, and he would come in, and we'd sit down, and he'd have that big cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee that was usually this time with him. Oh, well, what most people, and I'm now going to talk for a moment about Dance USA, what most people at Dance USA didn't know was that John Munger was a respected and beloved figure as a choreographer, dancer, an advocate, and teacher of dance in the Twin Cities. 
What most people here in Minneapolis St. Paul didn't know was what a towering and singular figure John Munger was in the national dance community as an exacting data collector, researcher, and analyst who became the single most knowledgeable authority in the world on the state of professional American dance companies and the geographies and economics of dance in this country. What most of us knew, like the proverbial mountain, depended entirely on where we stood for the view. I worked with John for three years at Minnesota Dance Alliance, a.k.a. MICA for you old timers. In the second half of the 1980s, that was when I had the great joy of living here in Minneapolis. From the day I arrived to the day I left, John was not only there, he was helpful, imaginative, forthcoming, funny, at times infuriating, <laughs> completely smart, and always reliable. He loved Hanya. Yes. <laughs> I loved Merce. <laughs> talk about it that much because <laughs> whenever we did it never went very well. <laughs> he was JRM. He made me B squared. Oh. Early in my Minneapolis days, Sage Coles came in to meet with us. Sage, you probably don't remember this little story, but during small talk after the meeting, I remarked that I'd finally bought a bed. And John said, oh, I got a new mattress pad. And Sage looked at each of us and said, well, you got the bed, and you got the mattress pad. <laughs> the look of alarm. <laughs> Leading into mutual and utter horror <laughs> that passed between John and me in the moment that followed that. Both clarified and also secured our friendship forever. <laughs> And what was forged here in Minnesota served us both very well for many years to come. <clears throat> Most of us who knew him reasonably well knew that he had many facets and that he compartmentalized stuff and that he could change hats on a dime. We knew his inclination to, shall we say, eccentricity, to stress. We knew how opinionated he was. We knew he lived exuberantly. We knew how pontifical he could be. And we knew how much he loved all those cats. I have cats because of John, and every time they misbehave, I blame him. And every time they give me joy, I say, thank you, John. We know how gleefully excitable he could get about his cooking experiments. We knew the joy he took in the artistic sides of his life, and how vexed he could get with the number crunching and the administrative manure he often found himself waiting in. We knew how outrageously, outrageously funny he could be. It was all part of the Johnness of John. And when I think about him now, <clears throat> I find myself thinking about things like spiritual DNA and legacy and the hole that someone you have loved and respected leaves in your heart when they go. I think about how much he walked the walk of generosity and passion and about the immense struggle with alcoholism that he faced throughout his adult life and about the heroic courage that it took to hold on as long as he did and do as much as he did and love as greatly as he loved along the way. Let me say a couple of things about the Dance USA years. I hired John there in the early 1990s. I lured him and Sharon to Washington, thinking I could persuade them to move there. They came during a hot, hot August weekend. We had a very productive visit. We had a lot of fun. We went to Mount Vernon. We talked. They came home back to St. Paul. I offered John the job, and he said, thank you very much. We are not going to leave St. Paul. I countered. I knew what I wanted, and I trusted him. And I said, how about you work remotely from Minnesota? That I could do, he said. And boy, did he. Year after year, he wrestled with the numbers. He wrestled them to the ground. He made sense of them. And that strengthened the organization and all those that it served. John worked for Andrea Snyder at Dance USA even longer than he worked for me there. And in recent email exchanges, she reminded me that not only did he write the book on information collection and analysis, he also mentored and trained his successor. He drove the board of trustees crazy with his detailed explanations on data matters, large and small. And he missed deadlines because he was so deeply enmeshed in sorting through data and making sense of it. She said, among other things, and I'm quoting her here, his inquiry log became a vital part of the research department's strategic planning for ongoing development. He was constantly frustrated 
that not enough could be done fast enough to tell the story about the changes in the environment for dance artists, managers, and organizations. She also said he had an absent-minded professorial appearance, which was balanced by his complete attention to the details that his research uncovered. John told many of us, I know many of you heard him say this over the years, when I die, I want to be because I took one dance class too many. <laughs> but here's one more thing we know. Dance didn't kill John. Dance saved John. Dancing, being with dancers, being with all of you, finding community where he could express and explore so many of his gifts and passions, being among people who loved him no matter what, and danced with him and for him on his best and his worst days. Dance saved him and kept him going and fueled that ravenous engine of heart and body and soul that eventually broke down in human form, but never lost the fuel of passion that drove him for decades. Energy never dies. It only changes form. And my friends, here's one thing more that we know. We are his legacy. It's us and those that we touch. We carry and pass forward that spiritual and dancing DNA that is the Johnness of John. For all of us in this room were touched in some way by the smartness and hilarity and generosity and imagination and triumph and tragedy and ultimate goodness of this man. He was peerless. <laughs> and oh, we are so blessed and so much the better for having walked and danced on this earth with him. Happy trails, my friend, till we meet again. shows some of John's greatest choreographic works, some of the works that he was most celebrated for, like Lord Cut Glass, Parasites, Committee in Session, If This Goes On, and many others. Enjoy. Warning dancers, warning sound, warning lights. Take the house out, take the stage out, please. <laughs> Dancers' places.
I'm going to stick with this person if she'll have it.
There was never any such thing as almost or good enough. My very first rehearsal with the third rabbit was the day after we got married. And I called John and, and asked if I could take that one off. And he's like, nope, I really need everybody there. <laughs> <laughs> and to him, that was the perfect way for me to spend my honeymoon. <laughs> Birthdays, anniversaries, Mother's Days, and other days for many years to come after that. John was also a, a comedian. Uh, last year, John played multiple roles in one of our silent comedies, uh, comedy shows. In one scene, he played a priest conducting Pierre Curie's funeral, and, and through a series of farcical mishaps, his hand inadvertently was placed on Madame Curie's unsuspecting bosom. Now, in my head, the scene broke down like this. Priest plus funeral times boobs <laughs> equals comedy gold. <laughs> Easy peasy, right? We'll nail it in one rehearsal. But John approached comedy the same way he did dance. What I saw is a quick honk. John unpacked into several, <laughs> lots of rehearsals worth of theme and variation. Was it, was it one touch? Was it two touch? Was it three touch? Did first contact confuse him? Did it strike terror into his heart? Did it lead to a transformative moment of self-discovery? <laughs> Afterwards, was, was there guilt? Lots and lots of hand washing. <laughs> out, out, damn boo. John loved that joke. <laughs> Soon it all had a rhythm that could be expressed in John's distinctive form of scat. And I suddenly realized only a dancer would cop a feel set to counts. boyish glee during these rehearsals was contagious, but it wasn't the wow, I'm touching real live girl stuff boyish glee you know, you'd usually expect from most comedians. It, it was a glee that came from fathoming all the possibilities of movement. And the possibility that if we worked at it long enough, and we worked at it hard enough, we could find the one and only perfect way for a priest at a funeral <laughs> to inadvertently grab Madame Curie's unsuspecting bosom. Amen. John. <laughs> John, old pal, I think we did it. And then as a choreographer, all of John's crazy abilities, experience, and knowledge, his loves and hates, and rants and raves, and manias were embodied in his dances. He created intricate, simple, angry, gentle, absurd, heartbreaking, bleak, lush, funny, and incomprehensible pieces. <laughs> but they were always distinctively John. He created stunning solos that were perfectly tailored for the dancer he set them on, many of the most memorable on himself. And then he made it his mission to bring all of that to a new audience. I've lost track of how many times I've read a Fringe Festival audience review or talked to someone after a rabbit show who said they didn't think they liked dance or didn't think they understood dance until they saw John. If everyone would stand up,
Okay, here's the real thing. <laughs> right away and say what John taught us is the answer is prayer. Dear God, where am I? <laughs> John loved teaching. When you think about Joseph Campbell's call to follow your bliss, teaching was that place of bliss for John. This is when he was playing with his full orchestra. He could tap into his knowledge of language, literature, music, and dance. He could perform and, of course, tell stories. Central to his teaching here in Minnesota was his Saturday morning beginning modern class at Xenon, which he taught for close to 25 years. Often he would begin class or the open house by asking, for how many of you is this your first dance class ever? People would kind of, you know, move back and <laughs> forth and a few hands would go up including mine at one time. And then he would say, well, congratulations. You have something in common with Martha Graham and Mikhail Baryshnikov. You walked into the door of your first class. Right away, you felt a part of something, floating on that beautiful arc of dance through time. Class would start with a drum walk to let go of the street, arrive in the studio, acknowledge the others. Then warm-ups to protect the body, strengthen the body, and teach the body. The warm-ups remain consistent throughout the term, always plies. And seasonally, the Bartenievs, drawn from observations of a baby's movement, the hieratic gestures developed by dance anthropologist John Wilson, and unique features like the crazy maker, or follow the leader. One felt safe in John's class. John was always extremely well prepared. The technique work and across the floor combination was new each week. John could read a class well and would improvise on the spot when he needed to break down a movement a bit or bring a bit more challenge. You notice right away in class that some people were very good Seemed like they've been doing this for years. <laughs> Turns out that they had. <laughs> there were some folks that took John's class for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. He called these folks the ringers. <laughs> John loved to set up a combination. With a smile, he would say, we're going to walk across the floor from here to there systematically adding layers of complexity till everyone was a bit kerfuddled. Then invoking Hanya Holm, he would say, as my dear old mentor used to say, children, you are too slow. <laughs> Often his teaching had two layers of meaning, the dance meaning and the life meaning. For example, one time in class, we were doing a mirroring exercise. Divided into pairs, we were to look at our partner and improvise movement from what we had learned. Then the partner would mirror that. After a couple tri tries, he said, I have a note for you. Don't do what you want. Do, 
do what they need. Each class had a speed and a progression, a gradual crescendo, till at the end we were running and leaping, and skipping or hopping across the diagonal of the studio, often to the music of Janis Joplin. With the final chord, John would say, and we're out of time. Burst of hoops and applause would follow, and John would close with the famous, thanks for dancing. After class, everyone was invited to meet at the Caribou in the city center for coffee to talk about sex, politics, and art. This became another important venue for teaching, the telling of stories, and lasting friendships. Over the years, hundreds of people from all walks of life took John's class. Some went on to join dance companies, some became advocates for dance, serving on nonprofit boards, and many became enthusiastic audience members and contributors to dance organizations. We're almost there. <laughs> John built community. John built a family with dance. Thanks for teaching, John. Thanks for teaching. of planning, I get to keep talking. <laughs> it's been asked uh, by a number of students. It was interesting, they came in from several different directions, that we do a few of the hieratic gestures. These were developed by uh, uh, anthropologist John Wilson, and uh, Tom Kantek also taught them in his classes at the Purpose Center. So uh, we're going to do them three times. We're going to do a set of five. And on the third time, then uh, Carolyn is going to read a prayer. This is a prayer that was important to John that he read to his mother uh, during her last days. And he quoted it to Carolyn and I from memory at the hospital. And then we read it to John during his last days. So we're going to do, Carolyn, yeah. we're going to do the uh, hieratic gestures three times. It's time to learn, and everybody can stand up. It's essentially a, a parallel first and second. Feet pretty much stay the same, it's mostly the same body. You start from here, accept your faith. Offer a gift. Call down the blessing. Nurture and loss. Completion. Okay, since she's holding that out, I'll speak one more time. We're going to do one more time, and then the third time we'll do it without me talking and we'll just uh, <laughs> Accept your fate. I offer you a gift. Call down the blessing. Nurture and loss. Completion. prayer for the holy rest. Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world lies hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then, in thy mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. for being here. This is only a fraction, a very small representation of what John means to this dance community at large. It is our hope that you will stay, that you will share your stories with each other, join, enjoy some refreshments from the Bright Lake Bowl, and continue to honor John in the work that you do. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.
uh, yeah, Ozone Studios or wherever. You and I get together. So, oh yeah, I took the minutes. Yeah, we have rearranged. But um, when I came on staff with Bonnie, it was quite different. It was in the process of discussion.